Good morning, Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. I'd like to welcome you on this beautiful Sabbath day. Things are starting to cool down a little bit, but uh, we're looking forward to the cooler temperatures that are still coming. So, so the, glad that you're here to worship with us today and those that are watching us on uh, Facebook also. Welcome to all of you. We have just a few um, announcements this morning. Uh, for those, uh, the elders, we have an elders meeting on October 6th at 6 p.m. Uh, and then the, um, the, the big announcement is the uh, expanded worship service that we, we will be starting getting back to normal worship services and, uh, and Sabbath school uh, services for some on October 17. So we're looking forward to that date where we can have um, a big uh, opening and that uh, we pray that the Lord will continue to bless, that uh, the numbers will be trending in the right direction so that we continue to open up and have um, expanded worship services together. Okay. Bow your heads with me this morning as we have our, our opening prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have blessed us uh, and that we can be here to worship you. Lord, we're so thankful that we can uh, worship you. You are a great God that is uh, deserving of praise and worship. And we pray that um, our worship service this morning will be pleasing in your sight and, your, and will be good uh, on your ears. Bless us. Bless those that are involved. Bless our speaker, George, this morning, uh, Moara, as he brings us our message. May his words come from your throne into our hearts. We ask for all this in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, moving right ahead for our offering this morning. So we'll have our deacons get ready to come and get ready for this morning. Our offering this morning is for our local church budget. And uh, even though we haven't been meeting uh, as well, uh, as much in person, we still have um, expenses for the church. So we pray that or ask that you'll continue to support the church with your offerings and that you'll bring those uh, offerings to the storehouse, to God's storehouse today. We bow our heads for a prayer for the offering this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have blessed us with an abundance, and, and may we freely give of that abundance and, and give to support your church, to support the ministries of this church, uh, which also goes on to support our schools and, and many other activities and uh, uh, missions and ministries that our church is involved in. Lord, these are all important, and we pray that you will add an extra blessing to the funds that are collected, uh, not only here today, but those that are giving online also. Lord, we ask so much uh, that you will bless this church, and uh, we pray that we'll be able to expand this, your message of your, your son, Jesus, and his soon coming, Lord. We pray that it is soon that Jesus will come and take us all home to be with you. We ask this in your name. Amen.
Got to tell you, I kind of got a problem. Getting old ain't fun. But I've got a rotator cuff problem in my right shoulder, and that makes my fingers numb. So it's kind of a bad combination for somebody that picks a banjo. <laughs> but we'll do the best we can with it. But we have a song that's about light. Now, did you ever try to describe light to somebody? How would you describe light? But this is a combination of two songs about light. I saw the light, and this little light of mine, we call it our light medley. And we, we have a lot of fun with it practicing, but we'll see what we can do. Like a stranger in the night Praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more darkness No more night Now I'm so happy No sorrow inside Praise the Lord I saw the light A blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claim for my own. Then, like the blind man, that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more. Be no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the
with me, if you will, uh, in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, if you're looking up on your phone, however you're accessing the Word of God this morning, turn with me to uh, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. And I'm reading from the Holman Christian Study Bible this morning. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. And this is talking about the road to Damascus. As he traveled and he was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, he said. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. May the word, uh, may the word of God be blessed, and uh, may Jesus bless us today. And now, George. Good morning, church family. It's good to see everyone here today, and for those joining us through Facebook Live, I want to welcome everyone this morning, and both our members and uh, some of our visitors that uh, might be with us this morning. Um, it's good to be in God's house. It's good to see uh, everyone here this morning. And um, a few months ago, I think it was probably five, maybe five weeks ago now, we, uh, the young adult um, Sabbath school class, we were studying the book of Acts, and we went through the whole book of Acts, and it was just a great blessing. And, um, and so, you know, when we got to this part of Acts, it was kind of this pivotal point in, in Acts where um, it keeps coming up over and over again, you know, Paul telling his conversion story. Uh, but one of the things that puzzled me was, why does he say, Saul, Saul? Why does he just say, why does he say it twice? So this morning, we're going to uh, get into God's word, and we're going to do a little study about that. So before we do, let's, uh, I invite you to join me in prayer. Um, oh, Father God, um, holy and worthy of honor, uh, you are, Lord, and um, worthy of our praise and our worship this morning. Um, and so, Lord, we just come this morning to you asking for your Holy Spirit, asking for your presence, not only just to fill these walls, Father, but to come into our hearts to transform us and to make us more like Jesus. Uh, Father, you know us um, from the inside. You, 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 you have hopes for us. You, um, uh, you know our names. You know the uh, number of hairs on our heads. Father, there's everything that you know about us, and, and we are, each one of us, special to you. And so, Father, we just come praying this morning that we might get a better glimpse of you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I don't know about you, but, um, and I don't know if this is your experience, but growing up, um, I remember um, whenever my name was called, as a young person, I, I, because I was in trouble a lot of times, I, would, I, I, de I developed this fine ear to hear whether when my mother was calling me, whether I was in trouble or whether I was be okay. So I don't know if any of you could relate to that, but it would be also my teachers um, or the deacons at church. You know, if so, the way my name was called out, you know, I would know immediately, okay, it's going to be okay or, uh oh, I'm in trouble and something has gone wrong. And so, um, you know, that, that, was, that was my experience. And I know that if there was the word Mr. associated with my last name, I knew I was def that was a dead giveaway. You were definitely in trouble. You know, if there was a Mr. Mr. Malara in school, I knew I was, I was in trouble. Um, and so I don't know if, you, if any of that you could relate to in terms of when somebody calls your name. But there are times when the Lord calls our names. There are times when he calls our names, and this morning we're going to survey a couple of examples in Scripture, and Luke, um, who wrote the book of Acts, um, you know, he's very kind of keen on this thing, and um, both the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke um, is thought that they were written together. Uh, they were both addressed to Theopolis, and so they, they, were, they, were, they were thought to, and some think that basically both books were written together, and um, so that there's this connection uh, with those two books, but Luke, kinda, Luke picks, picks up on this notion of um, names, and so we're going to go through and, and study that this morning uh, together. 
Um, the other interesting thing uh, about the book of Acts um, it, that, that was to me fascinating as we were studying the book of Acts, um, you know, the Romans uh, always kind of came to rescue from Saul. You know, they, they kind of came to, to rip Paul's rescue in, in a lot of instances. And so when you start putting this together, maybe Theopolis was uh, perhaps the attorney that was going to be representing Paul in Rome. And so maybe these books were written to be able to tell the story of the gospel and how then um, uh, Paul's conversion story. And so that he was a good guy. He was not a threat to Rome. And therefore, um, you, know, uh, you, can, you know, you can see how um, uh, Saul was uh, pictured in a good light. And it's no doubt that Paul was one of um, uh, Luke's heroes. And Luke had an experience with him. He actually spent time with him. Uh, in, in a lot of his missionary journeys. Um, so it's just very interesting. So as we read, uh, or as Mitch read for us this morning, um, let's see here, if I can get the, slides to progress. Um, oh, hold on, I gotta turn it on, I got, no I gotta turn it on, I just noticed. Yeah, I just noticed it was, it was off, yeah. Yeah, so there we go. So uh, I was, as was read uh, this morning, um, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? In other words, uh, Saul did not recognize God's word. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. One of the things that we learn as we were studying the book of Acts is that Saul, when we come across Saul, Saul is a very fervent person. He's a fervent believer. He believes he is doing God's work. He is zealous. He is zealous for his community. He is zealous for his church. He wants to preserve the, the integrity of his church, his religious traditions, his culture, and he is not afraid to use force. Because as, uh, as was, read, uh, was read, it said that um, Saul, uh, still breeding threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul has a picture of God that he believes, uh, and this picture of God, he believes that God would be pleased with Saul's actions in terms of going out there and binding people, not discriminating between men and women, and, and binding them and bringing them back to Jerusalem. This is a picture that Saul has in his mind of what God would be like, that God would be happy with him going on these errands, persecuting people. He has a picture of God. We can say that Saul was a passionate uh, man, and from the outside we might think, wow, he's a very religious guy. He's, he's, he's a very zealous man. And we would not be wrong in, in, in making, those, making those claims. Saul was also a very well-connected man. He had the cell phone on speed dial for the high priest. He can call him any time. And he did. He called him, got letters. Um, so he was a he was a man who was connected. Um, he was going places. Um, he was very fervent. He was very religious, you might say. And then he wanted to bring those who are the way. Now, the way, it's, you know, uh, Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. And so uh, they didn't call themselves Christian. It wasn't until Acts chapter 16 that we, we hear that they are called Christians. So they just called themselves of the way. Um, but Saul's persistence to, uh, to bring these disciples of Jesus uh, was pretty evident. So in this story, we, uh, and, and thank you for the song um, that you guys uh, sang, um, it, it's called a, 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 a theophany. Basically, he experienced this presence of God in some sort of form. And any time that this, this theophany happens, the theologians call it a theophany, it's um, an appearance of God. And usually when God appears, like if you remember, this is just a light surrounding him. Uh, to Moses, he appeared in a burning bush, right? It's always a condensation, a condensation. God 
condescends himself because the infinite God, the creator of the universe, he, to, you know, you know, to make himself known to us, you know, he cannot just come and we are not going to perceive him because we are the, cre the creator, we're the, we're the creatures, not the creator. And so there's this huge chasm between us. But he, so he appears in this light form to, to, uh, to Saul. And he uh, falls down to the ground. Um, the light is around him. And he, it is a voice that he does not recognize. But what is significant is that we want to look at why does he say Saul, Saul? Why doesn't he just say Saul? There's many instances that we, where, where that is done. But there are instances in Scripture, and Luke picks up on this, that the name is repeated twice. A name is repeated twice. And I'm wondering if any of you know in Scripture how many uh, are examples of when a name is repeated twice, that Jesus repeated a name twice, or anyone else. Does anybody remember? Want to raise your hand? Or, uh, yeah. Eli, Eli. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great one. Dan. Not a name, but I'd say a comfort, oh, comfort my people. Comfort, oh, comfort my people. Um, how about uh, Martha? Martha, Martha, right? That, that's another example. Uh, any others that we can think of? So theologians um, have this uh, rule, which is called the, or the law of first mention. So whenever something is mentioned in Scripture for the very first time, it has some significance. It kind of sets the, the context for what you're going to read further on or, or, or other times. So there's the first time in Scripture, and if you go to the Old Testament, um, you will find that um, there is a place when uh, it's found in Genesis. And so it's the first time that two names are mentioned uh, right after another, and God speaking uh, the name uh, it is found, and it's in the, story, it's in the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 22. And it's a story that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, right? Uh, and it's a story of Abraham and Isaac. So we want to take a look, you know, we're going to divert from, from Acts right now in Saul. We're going to take a little diversion and kind of talk about these other examples, and then we're going to come back to Acts and, and finish there. Um, so, Abraham, as you, you know, you've, you've heard me talk about the story of Abraham, and I love the story of Abraham, but I think the story of Abraham is very pivotal. It's a very pivotal story in the narrative of Scripture because it is, the Old Testament is, can be really condensed to a promise made, and that promise was the promise that was made to Abraham. The New Testament could be looked at as a promise fulfilled in that in being Jesus fulfilling that, that promise that God had made to Abraham. And to me, that's kind of the narrative of Scripture. And when we look at it that way, we go back and look at this story. And as you know the story, God had made a promise to Abraham that he would make him a great nation. That, you know, he said, you know, Abraham, look at the stars. See how many stars? Your descendants will be like the stars. He said, Abraham, you see all the sand by the ocean? Your descendants will be like the sand in the ocean. You know, great promise, right? So, but there was one problem. And what was the problem? Is that Abraham did not have a son, right? He was getting old and he didn't have a son. And so he tries to fix things himself. And so um, uh, Sarah, with Sarah's, you know, uh, permission, he goes and he uh, has a son uh, with Hagar. He has Ishmael. But that was not the son of the promise. That's not what God had said. That's not the son of the promise. And so... Um, he goes, and, and finally, Sarah conceives. She has a son. They name him Isaac, the son of the promise. And Isaac means laughter. But it's interesting that uh, God testing Abraham later on in his, in his experience makes a very strange request to Abraham, right? He makes a very strange request. Because if this is the son of the promise, why would you say, sacrifice your son? Why, 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 would you, why would you do that? Why would you sacrifice your son if this is the son of the promise, right? And so God tells him, go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son. But why would Abraham do this? So in order to answer that question and to understand here this, this usage, uh, we have to notice something. That Abraham came in the time frame where Abraham lived, he lived among the Canaanites, that there were seven um, nations along the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were not very nice people. They did some very horrible things. 
They did some terrible things. Among them was child sacrifice. Uh, they sacrificed him. They burnt him to their gods. They did awful things. So it is reasonable to imagine that Abraham must have thought when Yahweh says to him, take your son, he would have said, oh, Yahweh is just like Malak, just like these other gods that I am around, that are around me, the, the Canaanite service. So he wants a child sacrifice. So it, for Abraham, it would have made sense. He would have said, oh, okay. Uh, and so he, it, it still took faith. He still went ahead and did it. But the context of, of, of the story and the context of this is that it would not have been as strange as if you and I would hear God's voice and God said to you, take your son and you know, sacrifice him. If that was said to me, I would say, no, that's not going to happen because I know that, you know, Jesus was the sacrifice and, and, and I know that now that that's not what God requires, right? That's not what God requires of me. In, uh, in the story, uh, when Abraham uh, is going to do this, we have to look at, does God really take pleasure in sacrifice? Does, does, is that something that God really took pleasure in? And so this was something that God needed to correct. God needed to set the record straight. In Jeremiah 19, verses 4 and 5, if you have your scriptures, um, if you turn to Jeremiah, um, there, um, God speaking, uh, and he says, he says this on uh, verses 4 and 5, Jeremiah 19, verses 4 and 5, he says, because they have, because they have forsaken me, and this is an alien place. It means I don't recognize. This is an alien place. Because they have burned incense to other gods whom they, uh, neither they nor their fathers nor their kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with blood of the innocent. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons and fire to burn offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. God says, this is so repugnant. As a God, this is not something that I can even conceive of. I, that's not something that I, I find pleasure in. God says, I, I, it has never entered my mind. Why would anyone do this? Now you can see that there is this um, serious misconception about the nature of God and his character. In Micah 6, 6 8, um, uh, we, know, we, know, we know Micah 6 8, you know, which just says, oh, you know, he has shown thee, O man, right? We have that song, what is good, what the Lord requires of thee, but to love justice, to, do, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, right? But right before that, right before that, in the uh, two previous verses, in Micah 6 and 7, Micah says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? And he says, shall I give my firstborn, firstborn of my transgression, the fruit of my body for a sin for my soul? And that's when he says, no, 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 no. That's not what, what, what you need to bring. That's not what God is, uh, takes pleasure in. What the Lord required of you is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The people and culture around Abraham had perverted the view and the character and the nature and the picture of what God would look like. Abraham was not immune to the surroundings of his time. And that's why when we hear the voice, when we hear that voice and that repetition, uh, it means something. It means something significant. So when Abraham... Uh, as he was going up, uh, and, you know, Isaac said to him, um, look, you know, we have the fire, we got the wood, um, but where's the lamb? Right? Where's the lamb? And what does Abraham say? Abraham unknowingly preaches the gospel, and he says, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Another way of saying that, my, it would be, my son, God will provide himself a lamb, the offering. So he goes up, right? 
Abraham is about to do the deed. He's got the, the knife. He's got the son on the altar. And he goes up, and what does he hear? Abraham, Abraham. That repetition. Abraham, Abraham. That, re that repetition mean, meant something. That repetition meant that you're about to make a serious mistake. The nature of reality is not what you think it is, and nor is it the nature of God. So he got re reoriented. Abraham, you're about to make a colossal mistake about the nature of reality and the character of God. That was uh, what he was saying. Because the gospel is not about the amazing sacrifice that we bring to God, but about the amazing sacrifice that God provides for us. That is the nature of the gospel. You don't offer me a sacrifice. You accept the sacrifice that I offer, is what God said. The repetition of the name by saying Abraham, Abraham, was the saying, Abraham, you're about to make a big mistake. Do not harm the child. Uh, last Sabbath, uh, Pastor David preached about Moses. You know, I remember it was, a, uh, it was a good sermon about Moses. I, uh, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. He talked about uh, some of the things that, uh, that they did. Um, but, uh, it, you know, as we know, uh, this story of Genesis was written by Moses. And Moses also writes uh, uh, the, the, the story uh, uh, kind of autobiographically of, of himself in, in Exodus. But it's interesting that after chapter 1 and 2, when you, when you start getting into the story, there are three times immediately after his birth that Moses talks about himself, right? And Moses comes across a little bit of a bully, uh, if you think about it. He, he comes across a, a little bit of a bully. Um, uh, he, um, he goes, and um, in the story, the first time we see Moses... Um, he is, um, he sees Hebrews kind of fighting, uh, or like I see, he sees a Hebrew and an Egyptian fighting, right? And so he steps in and he says, hey, 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 stop, right? And he uses force and he kills the Egyptian, right? So Moses thinks that uh, muscle and strength are tools that he can use to liberate his people. Is it, would, would you think that that would be a fair assessment? The next time, the following day, there are two Hebrews fighting among themselves. And again, Moses steps in. He says, hey, 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 hey. No, 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 no fighting. You guys shouldn't, shouldn't fight. He steps in, right? Um, but again, Moses uses his muscle. He's, he's, he's using um, uh, his muscle to solve problems. But, um, uh, you know, that's not uh, the way you, you solve problems, perhaps. The third time, he flees, right? Because he says, oh, you know, I've been found out. You know, because the um, Egyptian basically, or the Hebrew said, are you going to kill me just like you killed the Egyptian? So he figures, okay, I've been found out. So he runs away. He goes to Midian. He's there at Midian. And he comes to um, the, uh, the well uh, there uh, in Midian. And um, there, there are some shepherds that are kind of abusing uh, the women uh, that are there, Jethro's you know, daughters that are kind of getting, getting water. And so he, he kind of, again, well, he kind of steps in, you know, with muscle and brawn, and he kind of chases those guys away and helps them, right? So the three instances right after uh, that, are, that Moses telling his own story are, are those pieces where he just says, you know, uh, I'm going to use my strength to solve problems. Moses is a bit of a hothead. He's obviously good with his fizz. Um, and so then in chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 4, he, he, goes and he, um, he goes and he spends some time now uh, there in Midian uh, as a shepherd. Forty years, right? Now, how well do you think shepherds react to strength? You know, can, you, can, you, can you just kind of bully sh sheep to go where you want them to go, you think? Probably not, right? So... So he's taking this, this time now, uh, Moses, um, to learn maybe a different lesson. Um, and so he comes to this experience. Uh, and this is the second time uh, the re repetition of the name is used. 
And so he's there and he sees this burning bush, right? No doubt uh, Moses' mother had told him uh, about that he would be some sort of kind of deliverer. And per perhaps Moses thought that it was going to be, uh, he would need his strength, he would ne need his muscle and his bravery to overcome and to do this work. But when he sees and he comes across this epiphany, this burning bush, what does he hear? He hears Moses, Moses. The repetition of the name. Moses, Moses, you're in the midst of a major misunderstanding and misconception of the nature of reality and the character of God. Moses, Moses. As was mentioned, uh, Jesus used this example. Those are two examples in the Old Testament. And we go back to, the, uh, to Luke, Luke chapter 10. We have another example. And that's the example of Martha. Martha, Martha. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Now as they went their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him in her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what, was, what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Martha is a busybody. She's full of energy, getting things prepared, Jesus, I am busy getting the haystacks ready. There is so much to do. There are so many things to do. And my lazy sister here is not helping me do something about it. I got a lot of things to do, Jesus. Just, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. So she protests. But the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. And there is need of only one thing, Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha, you're in the midst of a major misunderstanding and misconception about the reality and character of God. This devotional act of your sister is very important. Your sister has chosen the very better part. Devotion to God is better than being busy for God. Relationship is more important. And then, what about Simon, Simon? Do you remember Simon? Peter said, though all men will deny you, I won't. Do these guys might deny you, Jesus, but I'm not going to deny you. Simon, Simon. In Luke chapter 22, verses uh, 31 through 34. Simon, Simon. Listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you, your own faith may not fail. And you, when you once have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied me three times that you knew me. Simon, Simon, you're in the midst of a major misunderstanding and misconception of the nature of reality and the character of God. Simon, Simon. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That's another one that Jesus said in Luke chapter 13. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her broods under her wings and you were not willing. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're in the midst of a major misunderstanding and misconception of the nature and reality and character of God. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, seeing what was about to happen to it. So we go back to the book of Acts and chapter 9. And Luke you know, as he's writing these examples all in the book of Luke, all these examples of Martha, Martha, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Simon, Simon. Here he picks up on Saul, Saul. And it's no coincidence. I've got letters from the high priest, and I'm doing God's will, and I'm going to get these people from the way. Uh, and so he believes he's doing God's will. But 
believing that God is on your side doesn't really mean that God is on your side. It just simply means that you think God is on your side. The reality was that God was not pleased with Simon. God was not pleased with Saul. He was persecuting the church and forcing people against their will, detaining them. That is not how God, the God of love, the God that we serve, uh, acts. Saul, Saul, you're in the midst of a major misunderstanding and misconception in the nature and reality and the character of God. In each of the instances that we just looked at, in each of those instances that we reviewed about Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Saul, Saul. They were all making a mistake. They were all having uh, a reality crisis. In Acts chapter 9, if we continue in verse 5, when he said, Who are you, Lord? Saul did not recognize him. He does not recognize the voice. He does not know who it is. And the next three words that come out totally shake and shock Saul. The Lord said, I am Jesus. Could you imagine? You've been spending your life going through, chasing these people, and the very name of the heretic that you think has caused, is causing this is the one who is there before you. And it says, I am Jesus. In verse 6, he says, So he trembling and astonished, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He wasn't just trembling. He was both trembling and astonished. He was just totally blown away. Saul was not, was not expecting that at all. The very one that he thought was a heretic was fighting against his, fighting against his tradition, but it was Jesus. I am Jesus. Then he said, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open and saw no one, but then led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. If you turn in Luke, to chapter 6 of Luke, um, there is another example. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. And it says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say. In context of everything we've discussed so far this morning, um, and we look at this text, there's a, somebody's having a major misunderstanding about the character of God. In Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 27, Jesus is telling a story, and he says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once a master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and we taught in the streets. We were very religious, but he will say, I will tell you, I do not know you or where you're from. The point is clear that Moses uses this marker of repetition of the name. Luke picks up, up on it. Jesus uses it. And every time there is a misconception, even the example of Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had not forsaken him. 
Jesus emotionally was taxed and his misunderstanding of the nature of reality at that moment. God had not abandoned him. Our sins had cut him off. God was there. There was a misunderstanding of the reality that was, he was experiencing. So when Abraham thought that God wanted him to sacrifice his son, Moses thought that God wanted him to sort out his problems by using his own strength and muscle. Martha thought that uh, uh, God wanted uh, uh, that he would affirm her in her frustration with her sister Mary. Simon thought that God wanted to show a strong loyalty and of affirmation. Jerusalem thought that they were the exclusive chosen people. Saul honestly thought that with letters that he was doing God's errands. But what he heard was, Saul, Saul, what are you doing? Acts 9, verse 10 if we continue the story, he says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. You notice, notice the contrast? Saul, Saul. And he says, Who are you? Here he says, Ananias. He says, Here I am, Lord. There are times and seasons in our experience where perhaps God has said to us, Linda, right? He has called our name, Kim, Mitch, Dan. He's used, he's used our name, and we're like, here I am, Lord, right? Here I am. But I think in my experience as well, there are times when he calls my name, but it's not once. He calls it twice. George, George. George, George. Maybe I've misread a situation. Um, I've lied in a situation. I've lusted in a situation. I've been dishonest in a situation. George, George. You're in the midst of a major misunderstanding of the nature and reality and character of God. And this is not uh, to be a, a guilt trip, but if we took a survey of our spiritual landscape this morning, what would the Spirit say to us this morning? Would he say, Paul? Or would he say, Paul, Paul? Bob, Bob. Or would he just use our name once? If we surveyed our finances, or our bank account, what would he say? Or maybe that holy of holies, that secret thing, that portal that takes us through other worlds, our phones. <laughs> uh, what would he say uh, to us about that? My social media account. Uh, my Instagram, my texting, my web searches. Would he say, George, George? How about uh, our Bibles or our Bibles too, right? Do we spend time with the Word or spending time in prayer? And would we hear, George? It's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that'd be great. But sometimes we hear our name twice. And if we hear our name twice, it's because God is not doing it to cause, to be threatening in any way. He's just alerting us that we are in the midst of a major misunderstanding about the nature of reality and what we're about to do. In each of the cases that we looked at today, each one of those that we, that we reviewed, we can say that there was religious zeal was masking relationship. Simon, Simon. Though all men leave you, Jesus, I'm not going to leave you. Right? Religious zeal. I'm, I'm there for you, Jesus. 
Saul, Saul. It seems like religion is a really good place to hide from God. Religion can be a very good place to hide from God. And all the traditions and the things that we might do. But God is not after zeal. He's after our hearts. I was uh, reminded um, in a very interesting way this uh, about the nature of reality. And so um, God uses different things in our lives to, to show us things. Excuse me. Because that reality that God is after relationship is the same thing that he wants you know, for us when we're together. And so... I was sharing with uh, one of our elder brothers this morning. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I was just sharing with him how, you know, we come to places in our lives where we don't realize that we get busy, we're doing things. And the people that are more important to you, you're, you're ignoring them. So I heard, I heard God saying, George, George, I needed to hear that. And sometimes God uses other people in our lives to show us those things. And he used Ananias in a special way to, for Paul. He, he used him. Sometimes he uses our spouses. In this instance, he used my wife to point out the fact that I get busy with things and I'm not spending time with the people that I love. So, so it was good. You know, we need to hear our names sometimes. So I don't know what about you. I don't know what it is for you what God might say this morning. Would he say your name twice or would he say it once? As I was preparing and, and thinking about it, it just kind of really hit me. It's like, yeah, you're right. Here I am, Lord. Today, if you hear his voice, I pray that we can be like Ananias and we can say, hey, I'm here, Lord. Here I am. That we will recognize his voice. We will recognize the moments in our lives when we need that correction. We need to uh, stop and take notice of our condition. Because God is a loving God and he's just saying, hey, you're making a mistake. This morning, I just pray that uh, when we hear the voice, one, that we would recognize the voice. So if God asks you, hey, I need you to do this for me, you say, here, Lord, here I am. I'm here. Use me. Those high moments in our Christian experience where we're like, we're on fire. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. If the nominating committee asks me to do something, I'm there for you, Lord. More importantly, Jesus wants a relationship with us, and he uses the experiences that we have every day that we, that we meet. Um, so I pray that when he calls your name, that you will say, here I am. Here I am, Lord.
Father God, we come this morning acknowledging, Lord, that there are times in our lives and in our experience where we need to hear our names called twice. And there are times, Lord, that we enjoy the fellowship and we are just riding a high and we hear our, voice, our names called out once. And those are great experiences, Father. But Father, we need you and we know that you want more than anything else is to have a relationship with each one of us. And you have given us the family unit as a guide of that love. And so, Father, we just pray for all the families that are here today. Pray that you would bless them. Pray that you would bless everyone who's been here today. And Lord, may we be ready. See, if there's any conceptions we have of you that are wrong, that are erroneous, that are causing us to hide between in, in, in religion or whatever it might be, or zealousy, may that be just turned away. May nothing stand in the way of us just having a full relationship so that when we come, you will recognize our voice, that we would not be turned away. I pray for everyone here, Lord, that when you call our names and that our names would be written in your books, that we will hear our names called out once. And that will be a day of rejoicing. And we long for that day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.